also is part of the Department of Visual Culture's public program field reports. My name is Zach Blass, and I'm a lecturer in the department. I have just a couple of notes um, to share with you all before we get going. Um, we are going to be recording tonight's session, and I think you should have a notification in Teams that a recording has indeed already started. Um, please remember to mute yourself during uh, the first half of this event tonight. Uh, well, basically, just uh, it would be good if you kept yourself muted unless you're asking a question. So the plan for this evening is to um, hear Jasmina's talk for up until probably 6 p.m. Um, at 6 p.m., we aim to take a five minute break and then we'll come back for discussions and questions with Jasmina until 7 p.m. So now I'd like to begin a little introduction to the theme of the evening and also to Jasmina. So throughout the autumn term, talks in the public program have highlighted the transdisciplinarities of visual cultures and the ways in which they intersect with our departmental research clusters from the environmental humanities to critical finance studies, forensics to political aesthetics. And we continue these field reports further today, and we now turn to the histories, politics, and aesthetics of feminism and queerness. And this is the research cluster, our department titles, sexes, genders, and genres. And within the sexes, genders, and genres research cluster here in visual cultures, um, there is a particular interest in the styles and aesthetics of sex subjects, minoritarian persons, and other queer things, be they non-human, material, animal, human, before and beyond. So across the cluster, we studied the varied yet intersecting frames of gender, sex, and sexuality, feminism, queerness, and difference very broadly conceived. So today's lecture by art historian Dr. Jasmina Tumbas adds a vital contribution to this area of research. Um, with what I would consider a very passionate and politically committed uh, attention to feminist histories of art and resistance in the Balkan region. In her lecture titled The Feminist Legacy of Socialist Yugoslavia, Yugoslavinka and Her Performance Politics, Tumbas examines women's feminist performance politics in art and culture under Yugoslav so socialism, during the years 1948 to 1992, during its disintegration in the 1990s, and in the post-socialist context to the present day. Central to her study is the concept of the Yugoslavinka, or the Yugoslav woman, a term Tumbas uses to link diverse cultural expressions of feminist resistance in the emancipatory actions and works of multiple generations of women who lived under Yugoslav socialism or who were born during the Republic and came of age during its 1990s partition into independent nations. So we'll be hearing um, a lot about this this evening. Uh, but first, uh, before we dive in, um, please allow me to properly introduce my very dear friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Jasmina Tumbas. You know, I have to say it would be remiss uh, to not say that <laughs> Jasmina and I went to grad school together. Um, you know, we FaceTime almost, <laughs> well, we do FaceTime daily, pretty much. And I consider her one of my uh, queer life. You become mute, Zach. Strange. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> um, we lost you after queer life partner. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, that's all just to say this is a, a special occasion. Um, it would be a special occasion regardless, but um, it's, you know, it means a lot to me to be able to share Jasmina's work with you all and be in conversation with her. So uh, a little formal bio and then we'll jump into it. Uh, Dr. Jasmina Tumbas is an assistant professor of contemporary art history and performance studies in the Department of Global Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University of Buffalo in the U.S. She is currently finalizing her first book, I Am Yugoslavinka, 
feminist performance politics during and after Yugoslav socialism, which is forthcoming from Manchester University Press. And she is also working on a second manuscript titled On Gender Violence and Nationalism in Europe, Feminist Art and Resistance Beyond Citizenship. Recently, she served as the guest editor for a special issue of Art Leaks Gazette, number five, Patriarchy in Over and Out, Discourse Made Manifest, which was launched during the 2019 Venice Biennale. And her research has appeared in a variety of publications in academia and the art world, including Art Margins, Camera Obscura, Art Monthly, Art in America, and ASAP Journal. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jasmina Tibas. Uh, you? <laughs> oh my God. Thank you so much. I'm going to start sharing the screen right away. Yes. Um, just to be sure that it's working and everything. So you can see the screen, um, the full screen. Yeah, you're not in full screen yet. Yes. No, okay. now you are. Uh, I want to thank Urella Andrews for including me in this important and uh, highly regarded visual culture series at Goldsmith. And of course, to you, Zach Blass, uh, for, um, you know, uh, putting my name out there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it is an extremely tender and beautiful uh, moment for us um, to have, uh, you know, and it's, it's rare to have that um, uh, in these kinds of contexts. So I'm extremely grateful. And I want to thank everybody who's here. Uh, who takes this precious time away from the screen and adds more time on the screen to watch this uh, presentation. So thank you for your time and your attention. Um, I'm really grateful for you to be here. And I saw some really big names on the side in my field of performance. So um, thank you so much for coming. I'm very honored all of you are here. Um, <clears throat> OK, I'm going to dive right into it. Um, in his controversial 1971 fictional film, VR Mysteries of the Organism, Yugoslav black wave director Dusan Makaveyev empowered his protagonist, Milena, a radical feminist and sexual liberationist, to give the following speech in front of communist workers. And here I'm just giving you an excerpt. Our road to the future must be life positive, comrades. Between socialism and physical love, there can be no conflict. Socialism must not exclude human pleasure from its program. The October Revolution was ruined when it rejected free love. No excitement can ever equal the elemental force of the orgasm. Sweet oblivion is the masses demand. Deprive them of free love, they'll seize everything else. It leads to fascism and doomsday. Deprive youth of their right to the sweet electricity of sex and you rob them of their mental health. Restore to every individual the right to love. And at another point in the film, she proclaims the most well-known slogan from the film, which is, comrade, lovers for your health sake, fuck freely. As some of you may know, and many of you will certainly not be surprised, uh, Dusan Makaveyev's film was a quasi-documentary and fictional film on the work of Austrian philosopher and psychoanalyst Wilhelm Reich, who left Europe um, for the U.S. during the Nazi era, Germany in 1933 and then Norway in 1939, and who became most well known for his Orgon box, pictured here. Reich had studied under Sigmund Freud and developed a fascination with sexual liberation and its ability to cure diseases like cancer and fascism, and believed that his Orgon box could capture Orgon energy and restore libidinal forces within a person that was Orgon deficient. Not only did the Orgon box get Reich expelled from the Psychoanalytic Association in 1934, but it eventually led to a conflict with the United States FDA because he commercially produced Orgon boxes and their investigation prompted a court ordered burning of his books in 1956 and his imprisonment in Pennsylvania, where he found his death in 1957. While Dushan Makaveyev's fate did not take such a dramatic turn, it seems that some 14 years after Reich's death, the psychoanalyst's ideas about sexual, sexual liberation were still too radical, not only for the U.S., but also for the Yugoslav authorities, who censored Makaveyev's film and forbid it from being shown, which also led him to leave Yugoslavia. And like Reich, Makaveyev was invested in fighting fascism, including 
the liberation of women from patriarchal domination within communist and capitalist regimes, and especially within his own country, the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. So why do I begin with Makaveyev and Reich? My recent research and my talk today are invested in thinking about how political ideologies are linked to gender and sexuality. Specifically, I have been intrigued for some time by the complicated feminist threat of Yugoslav women as embodied in such epic figures of Milana, played by Milena Dravic, and their relationship to resistance. And this, of course, comes when we think about um, the ways in which the, the Cold War rhetoric paints, of course, you know, everything behind the curtain in this desexualized uh, Marxist way um, of oppression. And then, you know, the West as this place of freedom. But when we look at Yugoslavia, there's also something very different going on and which, of course, was not part of the Eastern Bloc, um, which... Uh, all of you, I'm sure, know, and where actually sexual liberation uh, was very much part of, of the visual rhetoric during the time, even if it was censored at times. Um, so here I just want to point out already this kind of dichotomy. Yugoslavia represents one of the most intriguing and paradoxical examples of women's emancipatory power during the 20th century socialism. The most politically West-leaning of all the socialist countries during the Cold War, Yugoslavia became a place where new trends in avant-garde art and film flourished, while Marxist ma Marxisms held sway, anti-fascist ideology reigned in tandem with sex and rock and roll, and women enjoyed more legal rights and social mobility, including access to education and labor mobility, than in any other East European and some Western countries. In, nine, in August 1945, women were legally declared equal to men. As early as 1951, lesbian sex was decriminalized. And by 1977, homosexuality, I'm not sure what sure, the difference is. But, okay. but okay. Oh, I oh, hear okay. and talk myself now. now. Um, if anyone has their sound um, on, could you, or speaker on, could you please mute it? So lesbian sex was decriminalized and by, uh, by uh, 1951 and 1977, homosexuality. Abortion was legalized in 1952 and paid maternity leave and the right to divorce was socially and legally accepted by the 1950s. In fact, already in 1928, some 17 years before the founding of Yugoslavia, a leaflet distributed by the communist and partisan leader Josip Broz Tito, who would become, of course, the president in Yugoslavia, declared that women were essential to fighting the bourgeoisie's imperialist war and invited women to join the Communist Party in large numbers to, quote, fill a fight till the end for the liberation of the working class. And here you just see two examples of famous women partisans who were fighting against, you know, the Nazis uh, in, in World War II. Jelena Petrovic's research on interwar women's authorship in Yugoslavia gives deep insight into the long legacy of Yugoslav women's feminist investment in anti-fascist resistance. Some of her research, for example, shows that in 1936, the magazine Jena Danas, Woman Today, was first issue titled Novi Feminism, New Feminism, declared that, quote, the fight for women's rights is the fight against fascism, end quote. The anti-fascist front of women of Yugoslavia was founded in the midst of World War II, 1942, and had over 2 million members by the end of the war. But by 1953, all of this extraordinary advancement for women led to the male-dominated, still male-dominated Yugoslav communist elite to declare that it had reached its goal of the liberation of women, and that feminism... <laughs> Thus was obsolete. Of course, that's a narrative we're very familiar with. And not just obsolete, but as a political movement that it ran counter the larger goal of the liberation of the people and was therefore self-interested and divisive. Um, the anti-fascist front of women of Yugoslavia was abolished in 1953 and many women were asked to retreat back into the sphere of the home. The Yelena Batinich's research has shown that partisan women who were an indispensable force during World War II, were
were suddenly left off the conscri you know, conscription list of the Yugoslav army and also out of the history books. Chiara Bonfiglioli's most recent book um, re analyzes also the double burden women in um, experienced in factories, of course, working as mothers and you know, having the full load as workers. And of course, in the arts too, in the immediate post-war period, uh, art became dominated by men, though that's not true for all sectors. And uh, Bojana Vidikanic, who is, I think, also here today, has a fabulous has fabulous research on the question of uh, women's participation in Yugoslav biennials. Okay, but the story is a lot more complicated than the idea, you know, that patriarchy won once again. And here I just want to share a semi-parody of Tito on the cover of the Slovenian magazine Mladina showing, you know, ripping through fascism with his big sword and wearing, you know, the famous Western silk suit. As it turns out, in Yugoslavia, despite the impressive and very large, you know, patriarchal charge against fascism, or perhaps in part because of it, women's resistance took an extraordinary form in the arts. And here you just see a couple, a couple of examples in Belgrade of how uh, incredible, like, you know, how many women were involved in like starting to think about feminism and the question of uh, um, uh, women in the arts. In other words, you know, what had been set in motion by women resistance fighters during World War II was no longer reversible and women's emancipation within the Yugoslav context is key to understanding some of the more contra contradictory and paradoxical elements of Yugoslav culture and its feminist legacy. A visual history of women's emancipation and the feminist movement evident in art and culture during Yugoslav socialism provides an essential narrative about a nation that has since then perished, but which remains the foundation for the work of feminist artists, theorists, and historians from the regions. And here again are more contemporary examples, of course, on the right, um, from the 90s, uh, uh, Merlinka, in, in, in a very, very well-known um, trans woman in, in, in the region, and then, of course, Women in Black, the feminist movement against war, which uh, was one of the bravest and, and first movements against the, the wars in Yugoslavia. And then on, on the right, I mean, I started on the left, <laughs> then on the right, of course, you see uh, Helena Janicic's uh, more recent work, uh, The Adventures of Horny Dyke, and then um, Yasmila uh, Zhvanic's most recent film, uh, in which Aida is another very strong female character negotiating this very patriarchal site of war in the Balkans. Um, the title of my book is inspired and indebted to the legendary folk pop music performer Lev Abrena's 1989 song and music video Yugoslovenka. And here I just want to play the song for you. Many of you already know it, but in case you don't know it or you enjoy watching it, here it is. And I hope you can hear it. Yeah. 
I apologize for stopping. This is my first time using Teams, so I'm still learning how to use it. Okay. Um, it should be playing still in the background. Okay, it is. So when she released her 1989 song, Yasem Yugoslovenka, legendary uh, folk, folk, uh, folk, um, folk performer Lepa Brena delivered this epic celebration of Yugoslavia's socialist multiculturalism in a music video that put to shame the state-sponsored socialist realist paintings typical for East European imaginaries. A gorgeous smiling blonde in a flowing white dress, running in the fields of green grass and golden hay, flowers in her hands like a young bride of the land. Brenna is shown followed by a marching group of male and female athletic flag bearers all dressed identically in white swinging their Yugoslav flags to the spellbinding chorus, Ein Yugoslovenka. Her eyes are the Adriatic Sea, she sings, she likens her hair to the Pannonian wheat, and her soul is Slavic. A pop culture legend by the mid-1980s, Lipa Brenna was a proponent of multiculturalism and pro-Western inclusiveness, but also an avid champion of what were considered to be more primitive forces in Yugoslav culture, such as local folk music shot through with Middle Eastern influences. Of course, these are two very famous examples of her Middle East embracing this Middle Eastern, uh, also in problematic ways. So we can talk about that uh, influences. Uh, the Yugoslovenka song production itself consciously sought to embody this wide-ranging inclusivity in that it featured three well-known multi-ethnic singers from the 1980s, Croatian pop star Vlado Kalember, Montenegrin pop star Daniel Popovic, and Bosnian Muslim rock star Alan Islamovic, with Brena herself born in the Yugoslav Republic Bosnia-Herzegovina and then living in the city of Belgrade, Serbia, and yet a, a different republic. The intensity of the entire Yugoslav love affair is further magnified by the bird's eye perspective of the camera filming from a helicopter in which Lepa Brena is seated singing into the open sky, basking in the wind and sunshine. Shortly after, the helicopter would become a visual pinnacle of her superstar status with her arrival at Bulgaria's National Stadium in Sofia in 1990 in front of some 100,000 devotedly cheering fans. In the 1990s, you, um, <clears throat> the pan-Slavic unity of Yugoslavia and a united Yugoslavia that Lepa Brena sings about was broken up into regional identities that became the basis of the independent nations of Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, Macedonia, North Montenegro and Kosovo. Of course, um, then came, you know, the big war, and here are just two images from, um, you know, what kind of a horrific toll it took on, on um, the residents of, you know, of, of former Yugoslavia. <clears throat> as such, the this, you know, the song Yugoslovenka and Le Pabrena as its icon signify the last breath of this unique socialist society, with Le Pabrena representing the first mega pop star of Eastern Europe in the 1980s, much like Madonna then or Beyonce today. As Yugoslovenka, she became an icon of women's emancipation as well as, more pervasively, citizens' uh, emancipation under socialism and in the neighboring socialist countries came to be seen as an emblem of what an open socialist country m might look like. And I always like to show this <laughs> image of the uh, pizzeria de devoted to Lepa Brena in Romania. Romania, which had an extremely, uh, she, her, her music was extremely coveted on the black market. Um, so how might we, then, might we then understand this figure of Yugoslovenka? Most broadly and literally, Yugoslovenka means Yugoslav woman, a term that encompasses multiple generations of women who lived under or were born, born during Yugoslav socialism. As my talk will show, the women considered here did not belong to a cohesive movement or a group adhering to the same set of principles. Their feminist strategies differed, and they often argued about how they saw the function of art and the role of the artists in Yugoslav socialist society. 
in its ex exploration of the significance of women's contributions to the Yugoslav project and, and of their performative visibility as constitutive of that project, the figure of Yugoslovenka complicates existing narratives of embodiment and nationhood in Eastern Europe. While Tito's Yugoslavia was instrumental in building a society that prided itself on uh, egalitarian gender roles, freedom of expression and liberation through collective action, the patriarchal hold on questions of gender remained a nefarious and ultimately most destructive element of Yugoslav culture. In short, the acceleration of socialism enabled the peaceful and constructive merging of the multi-ethnic Yugoslav republics, but sexism, patriarchy, and ethno-religious nationalism nevertheless remained at the core of Yugoslav society. Today, I will expl explicate a few examples from the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, and today of women artists who using their own bodies and socialist tropes, such as the five-pointed star and the patriarchal figure of Tito as markers of their Yugoslav identities and emancipatory strength, all enveloped in the figure of Yugoslovenka. The Yugoslav political project might have been destroyed in the 1990s, but it is my argument that its anti-fascist, multi-ethnic and feminist emancipatory legacy is visible and tangible in the performance strategies of w women and culture from the 70s until today, women who I broadly call Yugoslovenka. In this regard, it is not without significance that Lipa Brena had recently had um, a spectacular moment of contemporary resurgence this past winter with her song Yugoslovenka sung loudly by a Croatian audience, despite the fact that Lipa Brena is a Muslim woman originally from Bosnia and living in Serbia, of course, often associated with the Serbian regime and enemy of Croatia during the 1990s. As you can imagine, when she played the concert in Zagreb, Croatian generals and right-wing politicians boycotted the concert. But people in the stadium reacted differently. They were ready for reconciliation and celebration of a united Yugoslavia. And here I just want to see if you can hear them singing Yasem Yugoslovenka. Um, beyond the stadium too, many of us in the Yugoslav diaspora and those living, still living in the region of former Yugoslavia were watching the YouTube link that circulated everywhere at the time with astonishment. Of course, I went through all the comments that were made under the uh, uh, YouTube video and one comment I found uh, by self-identified Yugoslovenka uh, noted her euphoria from Novi Sad, uh, in which you know she she lists all the areas from which she wants to touch, you know, Skopje, Belgrade, Zagreb, uh, and then says, you know, everything is obvious. Long live Yugoslavia. In Belgrade too, Lepa Brena has become a central figure through whose life the legacy and destruction of Yugoslav socialism is currently being debated and memorialized in the Lepa Brena project, spearheaded by a new generation of queer and feminist dramaturgs, actors, and choreographers who recognize the many phases of uh, Brena's career during and after the end of socialism and in her embodiment of the Yugoslav project. The co-director and writer of the Lipa Brena project, Olga Dimitrievich, has pointed to how she experienced Brena's embodiment of strength and emancipation growing up in Yugoslavia, and I quote, Brena is a feminist legacy. For my generation, this is really important because we were watching her as she was beating up men, she was jumping from the bridge, she was flying the plane. Lipa Brena could do everything and you identified yourself with a woman who can do everything. For me, that is a huge pulp cultural feminist legacy." End quote. When walking into the space, I had the chance to actually see the Lepa Brena project, which was really amazing. Um, the audience is greeted by only one silent Brena with her body turned away, sitting next to a Yugoslav flag. Around her is darkness as she sits in total silence. The entire play is a musical that engages with the history of Yugoslavia through the ups and downs of Brena's career, as well as the ups and downs of the Yugoslav country. Brena, who attended the performance, spoke to the Lena Pro uh, Lepa Brena project actors and the press after. She commented, and I quote Lepa Brena, 
you made a chronology, a retrospective of all the things that that was survived, what happened, what was happening to a nation, and what happened with these 25 million people who need, and then she gestured the need, love, state support, and a good job. But then she also added in English, all you need is love, yes, love and money. The poster for the show features a Barbie-like body collaged together to account for her socialist and capitalist embodiment. Extremely long legs, referring to Brena's 1982 song Duge Nogge, Long Legs, a microphone instead of a face, a Yugoslav socialist cap, and a big blonde ponytail, a hammer in her right hand and a briefcase in her left, a shiny silver skirt, along with shiny jewelry and black high heels. Instead of her eye on her face, she has one eye clearly taken from a currency note. As she is captured mid-walk, her body is adorned with a huge pink star in the background. The turn to the pink color signifies the importance of Brena's reception in the queer community, but also echoes her, her other pr projects like pink. Um, one of the five Brenas, Brena of sexuality, is also played by a male actor. Dimitrievich noted, quote, in the whole network of signs, it somehow signifies the trans, drag, and the cross-dressing experience, actually that queer life on the margin, it is inscribed in the script of Lepa Brena's life. At the same time as the Lepa Brena project, Marina Abramovich had her big return to Belgrade with her first solo show since 1975 at the Museum of Contemporary Art, The Cleaner. After visiting the show and watching the Lepa Brena project last winter, it became very clear to me that Marina Abramovich might first appear as the antithesis of Lepa Brena's celebration of Yugoslavia, but that her oeuvre is nevertheless continually linked to the socialist star of Yugoslavia, no less due, of course, to her parents' anti-fascist partisan backgrounds. This background, is at once suffocating and formative for the artist, is signified in her most famous performance, Rhythm 5, in 1974, in which the artist lay in a burning star, symbolic of Yugoslavia, until she lost consciousness. While Abramovich cannot be called a feminist in the Western sense and has refused to call, or in the Eastern sense, actually, um, has refused to call uh, herself that and openly critiques the socialist system time and again, the analytical visual framework of Yugoslovenka shows us just how deeply bound to Yugoslavia she is. A kinship that visually threads through her entire oeuvre of the, from the 1970s on to today, much of which she owes to the feminist work of curators and artists who were her contemporaries. These women engaged I would say more productively with the complicated position of gender discrimination in Yugoslavia was prominently in A, reclaiming the symbols of the Yugoslav flag and B, thematizing the patriarchal power, patriarchal power of Tito. I want to then turn now to this bold visual provocation posed by Zagreb-based artist Sanja Ivekovic's revision of the Yugoslav flag, New Star. Uh, <clears throat> here, the artist replaced the signature of the red socialist star with hair arranged in the triangular shape of the female pubis, instantly magnifying that Yugoslav socialism was fundamentally tied to its women. By superseding the red star with that of female genitalia just three years after the death of Tito in 1980, Ivekovic's flag connoted both pro profound insight and foresight. At least that's how I read it. Yugoslav socialism not only owed its inception to women, but the country and its unity depended on women's leadership to persist, as if to signal that the country ought to have looked to women for emancipatory politics, not to the male-centered patriarchal nationalism so pervasive and destructive in the 1980s and 1990s. To push this analysis even further, it could be argued that New Star established feminism's kinship to the transnational and multi-ethnic politics of socialist Yugoslavia, in that in the 1970s and 1980s, it was women who transported this legacy of pacifism, communism, and anti-nationalism, and strove for a more just and egalitarian society, 
as if to replace Yugoslavia's social, you know, great socialist mantra of brotherhood and unity with a feminist sisterhood and unity. But of course, Ivekovic worked also in a predominantly male-dominated art scene. Like many feminists of her time, she was not against socialism, but rather she was disenchanted with the erasure of women and their agency in the Yugoslav project. Yugoslav feminists like, the, like <clears throat> Svetlana Slabšak and Vesna Kisic remember that their male colleagues in the leftist academic circles frequently made comments during public lectures about how there were, quote, too many women wearing makeup, or sometimes asked women for the opposite, quote, could you please look more feminine, end quote. In her collage, he's looking at me all the time, she thematized the omnipresence and invasiveness of the specter of this male leftist gaze. But here embodied in its leader and president, Tito. This work featured a black and white photograph of Tito placed right above a drawing of a female figure in bed who carries a surprised and worried facial expression with her hands trying to cover her naked body with a much too short blanket that bears the hammer and sickle insignia. Through the deliberate use of humor, Ivekovic's collage made palpable the sense of Tito as the male gaze incarnate. The scantly blanket here signals the shortcomings of Yugoslav socialism's promises for women, the proletarian flag used horizontally instead of vertically exacerbates the failings of the horizontally oriented egalitarianism of socialism, unable to protect women from patriarchal sexualization. The flag itself here becomes an erotic symbol instrumentalized to sexualize women in the name of socialist ideology under the veneer of emancipation and gender equality in official state ideology. But the emancipatory strength of Ivekovic still remains tied to Yugoslavia. In a stunning photograph of the artist uh, uh, by Dalibor Martinez on the right, Ivekovic is Yugoslovenka. She looks straight at the viewer with confidence. She claims the flag and its emancipatory charge for herself. The image of the father of the people as powerful as Tito's was inevitably also libidinally heteronormative, a potent domineering symbol of national masculinity for women to desire, for men to never fully attain, but to always haunt. This would become the subject of another powerful woman, artist in Zagreb, Vlasta Delamar. Delamar became the most controversial proponent of the embodiment of women's illicit desires as a form of resistance. In her 1981 visual orgasm, we return to the site of the bed under socialism, arranged as a grid of 12 black and white photographs of the artist's face grimacing in pleasure during masturbation. The images show Delamar on her back in a bed with her head on a large white pillow. The grid lines are painted with the light blue while her lips are painted red. This added coloration echoes the colors of the Yugoslav flag, blue and white stripes with a red star in the middle. Yet clearly the red lips stand in for a different political agenda than the red socialist star, not socialist brotherhood and unity, and not even its imagined feminist equivalent, sisterhood and unity. Instead, Delamar's visual orgasm is a radical investment in individual women's right for pleasure with the moaning mouth at the center of this reconfigured iconic political emblem. When Delamar's first solo performance was scheduled for the spring of 1980 at the Student Cultural Center, it was put on hold for months because of Tito's hospitalization and impending death. She remembered that it was not clear if or when he would die, and that as a young artist, she felt a bizarre intrusion of politics into her ability to make and present her work as an artist. Quote, there was a huge hysteria then in Yugoslavia, she noted. Everybody was afraid of what will happen when Tito dies. She added, to me, that was absurd, so senseless. As a young woman, I thought, why should I care so much about this old man? All I wanted to do is work. Tito died on May 4th, 1980, but she would have to wait a few more months 
until the situation, as she said, calmed down in the nation. The photograph of the performance shows her standing naked against the wall with the written words, quote, this was me in 1980 when comrade Tito died. Although only subtly noticeable, the word comrade here, even if at worst ironic or cynical, connotes a tenderness and connection to the late socialist leader, whom the artist, as many others, still admired. After Tito's death, the punk and gay lesbian underground scenes did not abandon the political project of socialism, but were critical of its conservative aspects, including patriarchal nationalism, which was on the rise and threatened the emancipatory movements of anti-fascist resistance pushed by Yugoslav women and queers. So these are just a couple of examples I couldn't resist to add, you know, some of the amazing queer work that happened in the 80s in Yugoslavia, including... um, Lots of uh, things in, in Vix magazine, um, not just, uh, you know, gay, but also lesbian issues. Um, but the same, you know, the, 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 this punk and lesbian scenes also had an extreme political commitment. Um, so in the year of 1990, the symbol of the star took on an ominous, me- an ominous meaning in Marina Gujinis, who was part of the scene, and Aina Schmidt's video work by locations. And here, just going, I'm going to play this, but with no sound, so. Um, the video work marks the end of the decade, just before the wars began. Gurdjieff and Schmidt inserted the figure of the socialist woman into used footage that TV Slovenia had filmed in the South Serbian autonomous region of Kosovo during the uprisings that followed Slobodan Milosevic's crackdown on basic human rights for Kosovo Albanians. TV Slovenia did not air this material at the time, thus by locations as an artwork uniquely bore witness to the injustices happening in Kosovo. It is part of an even smaller group of works, the only one to my knowledge, that centered the politics of looking at the conflict, the political gaze within the agency of the socialist woman. Her body is here is chroma keyed, a technique which allows scenes of violence in Kosovo behind her to be visible past the outline of her body, as well as through the round area around her left eye, erased from her face as several other parts of her body are also effaced. The gray color of her clothes echoes the dark industrial polluted ground of Kosovo, accentuating the contrasting cleanliness of her guise and white skin. As the sequence goes on, every sensuous move of her hands across her body erases more of it to reveal what is happening behind her. As politicians in black suits arrive and leave in a Mercedes Benz on the streets of the uprising in the working class district of Kosovo, the dull gray ground is pierced by the bright red tiny star of a a red read of a tiny Mercedes-Benz logo (laughs) at the front of the hood of the car. This is the most important turn for the symbol of the star relevant for 1990, as it signals the new and nefarious branding of socialist ideology by corrupt politicians to cloak their nationalist and genocidal politics at the time, especially Slobodan Milosevic, who still considered himself a great Yugoslav when he advocated for Serbian nationalism and the genocide of Kosovo Albanians. The red color of the Mercedes-Benz would also foretell the bloody wars and bloody capitalism to come, as this was the car that Adolf Hitler venerated the most. Yugoslavenka here becomes the figure through which we can best understand what was to come in the 1990s. And indeed, the 1990s were the most brutal times for Yugoslavenkas. The rise of ethno-religious nationalism, war, and segregation of the former United Country fractured possibilities for collaboration among feminists, who nevertheless continued to fight for peace and women's rights. The end of socialism in Yugoslavia meant new ideologies that advocated the return to the kitchen and childbearing for women, the crackdown on homosexuality, the mass displacement of women, the ideological, economic, and political authority of the EU, and the increased racism against the largest ethnic minority minority in the former Yugoslavia, Roma. 
I want to end my presentation by highlighting just a few brief examples from the 90s to today of how younger feminist generations have addressed this new status of Yugoslovenka and the possibilities for resistance. Shelia Kamaric and Tanya Stovic poignantly remind us how deeply the status of the Yugoslav woman changed during and after the wars. In Kamaric's Bosnian girl, a self-portrait in black and white, her body is debased with a 1994 graffiti she replicated from army barracks in Srebrenica that reads, no teeth, mustache, smells like shit, Bosnian girl. This is, of course, one of the most famous works from the region um, but very, very relevant. It is speculated that a Dutch soldier, while stationed in Bosnia with the UN peacekeeping forces, had made this graffiti. Kamaric shows us how by the early 1990s, you know, how much the status of Yugoslavia had changed in the European male imaginary just five years after Lepa Brena's hymn, not a blonde beauty, but a besmirched, toothless woman whose racial otherness is augmented by her excessive hair growth, ridiculed in her femininity by stressing her mustache, and above all, smelling like shit. Tanya Ostoic does away with the hair. She shaves it, she removes the markers of her racial otherness, but debases herself by asking to marry a man to enter the EU in order to speak directly to the stereotypes of male order brides and the precarity of Yugoslav women. Most importantly, her work exposes exposed in her embodied struggles, the EU discriminatory immigration processes. Of course, this is another really important work that ended up also being censored in which she critiques the EU and how the objectification of immigrant women, especially from Yugoslavia. And also very important is that Ostoyic likens this discrimination also to, you know, moments in the art world. And this is her performing Albio Angel um, with Harald Zeman. I mean, um, not with the permission of Harald Zeman, but, you know, intervening in the uh, Venice Biennial, but really showing, you know, the, the immigrant woman's um, uh, position of being an uninvited guest and following him around. And um, uh, the struggle of, of being part of the art world when you come from a country that no longer exists and also that a country that has a lot of shame attached to it and when you're a woman having to do so uh, and having to, you know, submit to, to women's, uh, to men's power in pushing your career forward. But questions of citizenship and legal status would be especially re relevant for Selma Salman, the youngest artist here, born in 1991, long after Tito's death and right at the time of the burgeoning wars. Salma currently lives in the United States, but the artist was born and grew up in a Roma settlement called Ruzica in Bosnia. In her works, she often thematizes the position of being Roma in the post-Yugoslav context. The legal rights for Roma worsened significantly after socialism and the rise of neoliberal capitalism, especially for Salma's community, in Ruzica, where Tito's era of socialism is remembered as, quote, a time when everything was perfect, end quote. Salman has used her art and her international connections to help the village and especially raise funds for girls to go to school, a philanthropic engagement that has inspired young children to scream, Tito, Tito, when they see her. And now she drives a caravan with the words, Selma ye Tito, written on them. She noted, quote, Everybody here looks at me as Tito because I bring them happiness, end quote. Salman reminds us that the era of Yugoslavia and the era of Yugoslovenka is far from over. In a random photo shoot when Salman was on the border between Trieste and Slovenia, she told me she felt relaxed, her hair, uh, let her hair flow in the wind. She had her picture taken. She then decided to call it I'm Yugoslovenka because, as she recalled, she felt, quote, really great and connected across borders. She told me, I felt like Lepa Brena. If a young woman originally from Bosnia, ethnic Roma, living in the United States and working as a performance artist internationally, lives and breathes the life of Yugoslavia and Yugoslovenka, then we might indeed deduce that the political project was destroyed by nationalism and neoliberal capitalism 
in the early 1990s, but that its feminist and multi-ethnic legacies live on in the bodies of new generations of Yugoslav women. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Jasmina, thank you so much. That was so amazing, incredible. <laughs> um, and also like, wow, like you amazingly timed that. Um, I think um, let's I go think. ahead. Let's Thank go ahead and take our our um, five minute break, and um, we'll come back right at uh, six, and we'll begin discussion and conversation. Um, Jasmine, uh, you know, take a break if you want, or if you want to use this to say say hi to some people. Yeah, um, sure. You know, like do what you want. We have five minutes, and then we'll start okay. back up. I'll be right back. Wow, there's so many people. Thank you all for being here. If anybody wants to say hi and show their camera. <laughs> hi, Amy. Oh, my God. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> oh, wait, you're muted. I can't hear you. <laughs> Tanya! <laughs> Tanya! <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. I said, nice to see you and thank you for your talk. You would think after working on Teams all day, I'd know how to unmute myself. But anyway, great well, talk. Is, oh, thank you. This is actually my first time on Teams. We use Zoom mostly. So, uh, yeah. Tanya, Kakosi, how are you? <laughs> oh, wait. There she is. You're muted. Think, You're muted, too. You're muted, yeah. Uh I'm so busy with activism, uh, I told you lately, so I, I decided so maybe I could skip <laughs> one of the, <laughs> one of the um, general meetings of our coalition, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I know hey, everybody... Ciao, Tanya, ciao, Yasmina. Put the demo. Thanks for coming. Hi, Boyana. I don't think we've met in person, so we're meeting now virtually. It's so nice, nice to meet you. Hi. Hi. Wow. This was Fredo. I see you as well. Is this Fredo from my, my former grad friend? <laughs> Wait. I don't know. I don't know. Nina. Hey. <laughs> oh, my God. Thank you for coming. How are you? <laughs> Good. How are you? It's good to see you. Greetings from yeah. Miami. <laughs> yeah, I'm, it's my relaxed day. I don't have to teach today, and I'm like no meetings. But I, I put my screen on for you. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> it was a treat for all of us. <laughs> well, let me look. Who else is here? There's so many people. It's amazing. This is a oh. huge. This is a great turnout. Really excellent. Oh, so yeah. much. Yes, Mina. Hi, Mina. <laughs> Ciao, yes, Mina. Oh my god! Uh, you are muted, so we can't hear you. Okay. See, I, I'm, I've been. Yeah, I'm zooming as well. Otherwise, hey, gorgeous, Hi. really, really amazing. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I'm so glad you like it. You know, I wrote this book in isolation for you know, so long and it's so nice to get, you know, to finally share it and to actually finally have finished writing it. So, um, you know, during yeah. COVID less. <laughs> Huge <laughs> congratulations on the contract with MUP, by the way. Awesome. Well, I'm in good company. So <laughs> <laughs> they good so series. Fun. Oh my God. Oh yeah. No, I'm so, I'm so lucky and so grateful. Yeah. Oh, it's your hard work. Your good research. No luck. Oh, in thank you. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So yeah, how is that? How, Amy, where are you right now? So I'm in uh, Aberdeen, Scotland, oh. north of the dark, cold, dark of, similar to Buffalo probably. We get dark winters, but, uh, are you in Buffalo now? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh wait, no, I, I, I don't see you anymore. Okay. I see everybody again. <laughs> um, it's a really uh, impressive amount of work. I mean, it's uh, it's great what you said, and I'm very curious about the book. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, there's so much more, and um, this is like my first time present, you know, presenting more of it. And um, you know, I, I I was telling Zach yesterday, I got so nervous. I'm like, how am I going to do it? All, you know, because it's you know, after you've completed the large research and the project, all of a sudden, you know. You don't know how to put it in an hour <laughs> or 40 minutes. Yeah. So there's yeah. also more of you in the book, you know. So, um, but these were just kind of a couple of highlights. And 
Uh, no, it was such a big journey for me to write it. And I feel so, you know, every time I even reread it, I'm so inspired by all the women who are in it and what they've done and what they continue to do. And I mean, what you're doing, Tanya, right now, you know, I mean, it's just so amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's really impressive, Yasmina, you it's it's different from your PhD thesis, right? Like it's a totally different. Yes. That is very rare yeah. to most people take the easy route, a trans, you know, turn the PhD into a book and you've like written a whole new book. Yeah, I did. But I have to say it was also in part, I mean, I, you know, it's been a while. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of, I changed my project in the last two years, basically. I had the epiphany of what I really want to say and what I really want to do. And, you know, I had this whole thing and then I cut. So I have a, a lot more written that it's not, you know, not in the book, but I think it, it you know, I, kind hey, of, Jasmine, I, no? I know, I know. <laughs> I'm going to jump in. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. I want to make sure we all have time. Sure, sure. Um, okay. Well, that was, I mean, clearly you have a lot of fans. <laughs> that was so amazing and wonderful. And, you know, great to hear how it's developed, you know, over the last, I think, 10 years or so since I've been following you do all of this research. Um, so I have a set of questions prepared that um, I will ask and then we can uh, transition into a uh, general discussion. OK, so I thought uh, the best place to start would be. Um, to talk more directly about your book, because um, what you presented, um, I know that part of that is um, the material that's going to be in this book that's forthcoming. So I thought it would be nice for everyone to get a chance to hear, um, you know, just uh, more details about the book. How is it organized? How does the figure of Yugoslavinka specifically operate in the book? Oh, I was really hoping you'd ask that. <laughs> so I actually prepared a couple of slides about my book, if that's OK. Um, and I'm going to share those in the PowerPoint. Um, OK. Oh, wait. So this was the end. But um, so basically, I, I shared some of the work that's in the book, but it, it has certain themes that I'm addressing. And it's not really chronological and it's not all inclusive, but uh, it touches, I mean, on on many different um, areas. But the first chapter in my book really looks at um, art and feminist performance politics um, in this under the idea of the body, you know, the Yugoslavian body under patriarchal socialism. And so I look a lot at body work, performance art, um, you know, and you just heard me sort of analyzing uh, Vlasta Delamar's work. It also deals a lot with, you know, how do we approach um uh, feminism, or how do I use the term feminism when someone like Vlasa Delamar wouldn't identify necessarily as a feminist? Uh, and so I kind of unparse those kinds of questions in that chapter and look at, at body art as a form of addressing both emancipatory strength and also critiquing patriarchal uh, uh, conditions. And then my second chapter was, for me, the most experimental and fun um, and in terms of, you know, what I what I was doing a little bit more outside my area by looking at pop music, but I really, really loved going there um, is when I, I look at three huge icons of Yugoslav uh, Yugoslavenkas for me, which are Marina Abramovic, you know, in the Western sphere of, of galleries and uh, global performance and global contemporary art and also at home. And then, um, uh, you know, Lepa Brena, who's this big pop star figure you've heard me talk about now. And then, of course, Esma Rechepova, who is this huge figure, uh, um, you know, in, in Yugoslavia representing, you know, ethnic Roma um, worldwide, but also representing Yugoslavia as a nation worldwide, you know, with, with uh, thousands of concerts. So here I think about these three figures and how they, you know, uh, embody the socialist nation, how their work, um, you know, touches on Orientalism and um, how they embody the Yugoslav legacy. And so one of the things that's very interesting is that, of course, uh, Marina Abramovic, uh, you know, does things like Balkan epic erotic in, in the early 2000s, uh, in which, you know, she orient almost one could say orientalizes herself by wearing these uh, uh, folklore outfits and, and really engaging with a uh, question of folklore. Lepa Brena, 
casts us both as this like white city cosmopolitan Yugoslav woman, but also is playing with you know Orientalism and and using it to sell her music, uh, but also speaking to a very uh, particular multiculturalism within Yugoslavia, which absolutely includes that part of culture, which is why why it is so important that it is featured. And then, of course, Esma Rechepova often does the opposite. Instead of having, you know, orientalizing herself more, she then knows how to slip into Western clothing, like an Austrian television, for example. Um, you know, instead of wearing um, some of the more traditional clothing, then she wears like Western clothing. So these tensions around like identity and performance, uh, you know, within the women's bodies is, is really, really interesting to me. So that's what I explore in the second chapter. And then the third chapter uh, uh, deals with you know, queer Yugoslovenka and the legacy of, um, you know, lesbian work uh, from from Yugoslavia, which includes uh, also figures like Marina Gojinic, um and, you know, some of the archival research I did around, uh, um, you know, publications, uh, alternative publications in the 80s, and then more contemporary work like Helena Janicic's, you know, a kind of folklore uh, lesbian Yugoslovenkas, uh, you know, sh- kind of going back to the, the uh, folklore identity of Yugoslavia. And then um, I haven't talked about this at all, but this is kind of uh, uh, also a very important chapter. I kind of take up NSK in my book and I look at, uh, you know, um, this really, really important um, group, Neue Slovenische Kunst, which, of course, introduced uh, uh, absolutely uh, uh, radical ideas around uh, retrogardism and, you know, avant-garde art and uh, national uh, national socialism and uh, ideology embedded within aesthetic discourses. But one of the things that really struck me was, you know, their engagement with women. And so I did, uh, you know, quite a bit of uh, research and interviews or rather, you know, uh, uh, asked uh, some of their main members like questions around uh, gender. And so one of my chapters deals with, you know, what does it mean for someone like Eda Chufer, who is a fantastic artist and extremely prolific uh, uh, for, for the NSK group to be sort of one of the few women within that group in the 1980s. And then, of course, I also touch on uh, this amazing and very controversial image of Marina Bramovic with uh, the, the um, Irvin slash NSK members. Okay, last but not least, thank you for enduring <laughs> my detailed discussion of my chapters. I'm a little very close to the book still uh, because I just finished it. So uh, that's when I really dive into, you know, um, uh, the 1990s, all the feminist work that w- uh, women were doing, uh, the ways in which the image of Yugoslav women changed dramatically, you know, um, for example, also the uh, Miss Sarajevo uh, contest, how there's all these Western projections on Yugoslav women, but also the important work that groups, feminist groups like uh, Women in Black were doing uh, in order to raise awareness and how they put their own bodies, you know, uh, into into the streets. And then, of course, you saw me talk about Soma Salman and this question of Roma identity and ethnic Roma within the Yugoslav context. Um, yeah, and then basically what I'm trying to think about in my book is Yugoslovenka as a kind of wide-ranging model for feminist performance politics and art and culture, thinking about that figure of socialism, um, you know, and feminism in, in, in the 20th century being a really interesting model of re-embracing and thinking about transnationalism and collaboration and feminism across borders. So, yeah, that's kind of what my book is about. <laughs> I'll stop sharing now. Thank you. <laughs> oh wait, did I stop? Did it stop sharing? I, yeah, it stopped sharing. Oh, thank you. Um, I think another uh, component that would really um, enrich people's understanding of your research and your commitments is maybe if you would be open to talking a bit about your own personal background because oh. I, you know, you you are from the region, and I wonder. You know, um, how does that feature in this work? And, you know, it, I guess it also just gives an opportunity to reflect on relations of the personal and the political, you know, specifically within with feminism. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is such an important question. Um, yeah, it's very personal project for me. Um I, I am from former Yugoslavia and, you know, um, my father was a deserter against Milosevic. 
And I ended up being, you know, with my family, my sister, my mom, my father and I were refugees uh, living in Germany. And so um, it was really hard. And I know everybody who is part of that diaspora uh, who is here today knows, um, you know, kind of living through that the 90s and trying to understand what happened to one's country and no longer, you know, people correcting you when you say I'm from Yugoslavia and they're like, no, you're from Serbia. And I'm like, I don't I don't. <laughs> I don't agree. So, you know, and I had to at one point in the 2000s just say, yes, I'm from Serbia. You know, Yugoslavia no longer exists. But actually that question or that yearning of thinking about that project as not completely dead, I never sort of went away inside me. And this project allowed me to really think about where we might still see it. Where are the spaces where Yugoslav, you know, culture is is present. And one of the spaces I found it most present was, you know, my own mother and grandmother. And I started to think about all these other mothers and grandmothers I knew from my Yugoslav friends who were fierce, hardworking, who had extremely well-developed moral sensibilities, who could talk about politics endlessly, talk about working class issues endlessly, and think about, you know, justice in society. And I realized that in some way, uh, if I may say so, my German friends, did, you know, their parents had very different discussions at the table <laughs> than than we did. And so I started to think, you know, where is this coming from? Where is this, uh, you know, why why are all these women that I know from the region so extremely, pro, you know, uh, uh, eloquent when it comes to um, discussions around politics and uh, kind of a sense of their own work ethic. And so um, that became something I started to embrace just a couple of years ago to really think about feminism as it is situated in working class, you know, embodiment in the family and, you know, in, in one's immediate surroundings, which is actually another form of, uh, you know, education that begins much earlier than once you hit the academic books and feminist theory and feminist history. And then I began to think, like, why isn't this part of socialism reflected in the literature so much? You know, that was really strange to me because when I went, started to go to the U.S. and even in Germany, you know, the, the discourse was always that, oh, those behind the Iron Curtain, the communists and everybody's oppressed, everything is terrible. And my experience was everything was kind of amazing, uh, you know, my both my parents were working class and, you know, but but I just they had a very different story than what, you know, we were being told. And then with na the rise of nationalism, embracing Yugoslavia is also a way of resisting um, this like ethnic, these ethnic divisions, at least for me politically. So that's where I'm coming from. I, I'm extremely um, politically invested in this project. I also make that clear in my introduction. I, you know, it's not. Um, you know, I'm I'm really trying to rethink the Yugoslav project and give it an, a new voice also through emphasizing women's work, um, but also not do it uncritically, because clearly once I started to dive in, I realized that patriarchy is also a big part of it <laughs> and might actually be uh, one of the reasons why it tanked the way it did. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was going to ask you a more general question about feminism, but I think you already kind of okay. answered it because I just I've known this project in different iterations and it and the earlier versions of the project was more of almost standard art history of the region during a particular um, set of dates. And, you know, to me, the the question of feminism, you know, it does evoke this relationship, the personal and political and that's when the project clicked and really fell into place for you. That but is in, true. But, yeah. you know, um, in relation to feminism, you've also published on um, questions of uh, ethnicity, particularly, you know, as you touched on in the talk on ethnic Roma. So I think that that would be interesting to hear more about how does um, ethnic difference feature in your work and, it, you know, if you want to talk about that uh, in relationship to feminism or, you know, work that's uh, in development, that would be great. Oh, yeah. Thank you also for that question. I think that's very, um, very much also part of the root of the work and in many ways has to do also with the personal experience. Um, so I, I'm just going to give a short note about that is that, um, you know, I grew up. Uh, in a family where, you know, Esma Rechepova was playing all day long, you know, and um, 
my father was extremely like uh, and my mother as well they were extremely respectful of Roma culture and saw that as part of Yugoslavia and the whole rhetoric really was Yugoslavia uh, for everybody but then um what happened was that we were on this German status called Duldung, toleration status, which I don't know if Tanya is still here, but Tanya Stoich, you know, deals quite literally with that, um, uh, with the violence of that status uh, and, and uh, visa status in Germany anyway for um, uh, the early 1990s. And then we were deported in 1994. And one of the um, signature, like really like important experiences I had back then, even as a young, you know, teenager was that in the camps, I mean, it was really, really hard to be in, in, in the refugee camp in 1994. Of course, like I had it much easier than all the Bosnian refugees I met. And, and I felt extremely lucky because I hadn't, you know, I, I came from Germany. Being deported from Germany is very different. Um, and yet, of course, it was very difficult. But one of the things I experienced there was extreme anti-Roma hatred. And it shocked me. I had never experienced anything like it growing up in Yugoslavia. And that's when I started to see that there is this whole nother dimension of ethnic, of ethnic difference tied directly to citizenship, tied directly to na nationhood, and uh, that had, uh, uh, you know, extreme uh, consequences. And that has not gone away. <clears throat> Actually, it's only gotten worse, as we know, in Hungary uh, and, and in, former, in the republics of former Yugoslavia. And so that has been the subtext of all of my work. And in some way, it was harder to include it, for example, when I was doing my dissertation research, because there is this separation between, you know, high culture of, you know, conceptual art, performance art, and, and the interest in the body. And then there's all this other stuff like film studies, as uh, you know, uh, Emir Kusturica's films that are doing all this exploitative work. And so I, it took me a, a, a while to actually kind of find a way to to think about this issue and how it relates actually to the larger visual production. And in, in some ways, that's also why my project changed so dramatically from, uh, you know, um, traditional art history, because traditional art history, a lot of the time does not have place for this, unless it's in this like high art, global art, contemporary context where someone like intervenes. And that's why it was important for me to include someone like Esma Recipova, who is, you know, this pop icon uh, that actually we have to account for the visual legacy of this woman within the Balkan context. And um, the fact, for example, one of the things uh, that she says a lot in interviews, or she said, you know, she, she died a few years ago, um, and also, I had a chance to meet Esma Rechepova, by the way, um, before she died, the year she died in Pittsburgh. And I just want to know that she was extremely open and talked to me directly, you know, although she was this like huge star, which also made me even more motivated to make sure I include her, you know, in, in, in this important study. So um, uh, I guess what I was trying to wait, where was I going with this? Uh, you know, her visual legacy for the question of female empowerment is really important and goes beyond, you know, just the, the ethnic divisions. But one of the things she always pointed out is that she, you know, met Tito at an early age and he had favorite songs that she would sing. And he really, you know, wanted her to be one of the representatives of the Yugoslav project. That is unfathomable today that any of those nations would say, oh, we want, you know, this, this, Roma woman to represent our nation. But, you know, that, what does that say about, I mean, there's still a patriarchal relationship, but what does it say to you about a project, a multi-ethnic project? Of course, that's also part of the non-alignment movement, but like that embraces diversity in this way. And so um, that's kind of how both in, in the pre-war time and then post-war time, I'm very much interested in this question. And I also think that this is my second project deals with this, you know, immigration and citizenship. So many of Yugoslovenkas then share the burden of not having citizenship and being in this, uh, you know, liminal space of not being allowed to work, not being allowed to uh, cross the border. But then if you have on an additional uh, discriminatory element of being, you know, a minority within a newly formed nationalist uh, a country, then then things are even worse. And so we have to account for, for the, the largest ethnic minority in the in Europe that is it, it encounters unimaginable persecution to this day. 
So that's kind of why I'm I'm still very much um, committed to that, and and I think we all should be. So, so you brought up um, how you do art history and kind of pushing against the limits of what art history, I guess, normatively can and can't do. And I think this will be my last question, but. I actually wanted to ask you a question about art history because you are an art historian um, and I know you spend uh, and you invest an incredible amount of energy in doing archival research in meeting with the artists, if you can, that you're writing about, engaging with them, having discussions. Um, But you also teach in a global gender studies department. So you're an art historian in a gender studies department. And um, you also are um, you're an activist. And, you know, over the years, you have, you know, for instance, uh, for those of you that are familiar with the local activism uh, Jasmina has done uh, in Buffalo, she um, uh, was one of the um, main organizers of launching the, um, oh, I f- now I'm forgetting what it's, yeah, sorry, sanctuary, I couldn't think of the words, uh, turning the University of Buffalo into a sanctuary campus. And also um, you helped, uh, well, you were instrumental in de <laughs> this horrible local uh, misogynist, racist politician from um, a local school board. I mean, I'm just highlighting these elements um, of gender studies, activism, and, uh, um, you know, and art history, because you, your work does um, certainly thread them all together. And you can see that those are all commitments um, in your life and in your research. So anyway, it's just a general question to reflect on, like, what does it mean to be an art historian to you? How do you think of yourself working with the discipline of art history? Also, just because in visual cultures here at Goldsmiths, I mean, we do art history in a kind of unorthodox way. And I think, you know, you're doing something a little different than what often happens in our department. I think it would be interesting to hear uh, you reflect on that, if you don't mind. Yeah. um, Thank you. Wow, that's such a great question. You know, I feel very comfortable in the gender studies uh, setting, I have to say, because, you know, we all know that art history can be a little more conservative on the conservative side of things. Um, And what I really like about, uh, you know, women's studies programs and global gender studies programs or gender studies programs is that often there's an interdisciplinarity that kind of accounts for a lot of different threads that might come together when you tell a narrative about a particular region, which is what I'm trying to do, a visual narrative, which for me, of course, also includes pop culture and and other kinds of things that in art history until recently weren't necessarily really, you know, something that you would embrace traditionally. But still, yes, I do methodologically also embrace very traditional methods like going into the archives. And one of the things that made my uh, work Uh, grow so much is the kindness and support of the archive, you know, people who hold these archives in Yugoslavia themselves. So I, if you don't mind, I do want to comment on that because that is not a given for art historians, you know, access to material often comes with extreme, you know, privilege or elite status, depending on what school you're from. But my experience has been in former Yugoslav area, especially with someone like Una Popovic at the, you know, Belgrade, um, Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, even, uh, you know, the Art World Art Research Center um, in, in Zagreb. I mean, uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art Archive, like everyone just welcomed me with open arms and let me do research for weeks on end, would send me materials, would find materials for me and come back and, and over and over again. And the same goes for the artists who also, cha- you know, you, you know, shared their materials. And that interpersonal relationship is extremely important, I think, for, for, for the work to, you know, come together. But um, um, and in, in some ways, uh, you know, th- there's no way to do that. Kind For me, there's no way of telling the story without doing that work of meeting the people who are in my storylines. Um, I'm trying to <laughs> see where else I was going to go with this. And in, in, in terms of thinking about the work and activism. And I I really appreciate you bringing it up. I mean, I feel like because I was finishing my book in the last two years, I have been more on the down low when it comes to participating in in these struggles. But I think that 
my own experience of doing so really informed how I looked at what people have done in the past, you know, um, and, and also has motivated me to do more. So looking at Yugoslav feminists in the 1980s organizing on their own, I thought, okay, well, why don't we organize on our own here too, you know? And so, so this kind of informs then, uh, you know, the work has many ways in which it echoes into, you know, scholarly work, performance work, into collaborative work. You know, I through this research, I meet other people who are in different disciplines, who are uh, also beyond the arts, who are, you know, doing research on the region. So so that is really important to me. And I think gender studies is a really great place to have that kind of freedom um, for, for that kind of work, interdisciplinary work. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, I think you. now is a, is a really good time to transition to um, questions, comments from everyone else that is here. So you are welcome to um, raise your hand. And if you'd like to turn your camera on and ask Jasmina a question directly, that would be fantastic. Um, if you uh, would prefer not to do that and you want to add a question in the chat um, that is also absolutely fine and i can read that out for you but yeah we would love to hear from you please amy has her hand up <laughs> oh amazing I'll start. Okay. i'm always the one not not shy. oh tanya is coming in maybe tanya wants to go first <laughs> Hi, Tanya. Okay, so I have two questions. I mean, first of all, the, the book is fantastic. It's, um, you know, it's so great to see a discussion of not only, you know, feminism, but sort of intersectional feminism dealing with, um, you know, LGBTQ plus uh, Roma, you know, minority. And I wonder, so I have two questions for you. One is, I wonder, because I know you, you've historically been really into theory and you talk about your sort of move away from not maybe not away from theory but you know into different areas and I wonder the extent to which intersectional feminism has sort of helped or hindered you know the or or have you just completely ignored you know the the sort of theoretical debates going on and just focused on Yugoslavia and then my second ex uh, question is the extent to which um, class differences and national differences might impact this this idea of Yugoslavenka, and I the reason I ask is because I there's a Croatian artist I know from Dubrovnik who said, "Don't ever say Yugoslavia to me." It was a male artist, of course. Don't ever say that. Be careful because you know you could get some. You know, don't post it on Facebook because I could get some enemies. And obviously Dubrovnik had a, a you know, a, a very poor, uh, well, you know, the history in the war, they were bombed in the war. So what to what extent do not only those national differences, but also class differences, because we know that Abramovic and Ivekovic and Delamar are all from and other artists are really actually do have different class sort of, um, uh, you know, situations. Um, so th those are my two questions for you. Oh, those are so good. <laughs> Thank you. No, I mean, it's it's really, you know, the book can't it doesn't account for all of these nuances. But I hope one of the things I really want is for this. And I say this in my book I didn't say this in the talk is like for it to be a, a, a moment of like expanding, you know, this discussion to include a lot more. Um, so in terms of feminist theory, this is such a good question. And one of the things that I actually do in the in the book is look at more local feminist debates. I'm not as interested in bringing like Western feminist debates into it here and there. I have like maybe this or that, you know, about especially around pornography and some of the, you know, resistance to pornography, especially. But what I really ended up doing is reading a lot more sort of in the local area. And one fabulous book, and all of you should get it, is, you know, Sofia uh, Sofia's Loran's book, The Feminist Challenge to Socialist Yugoslavia, I think it's the title. I mean, I read that book, you know, like it's a, it's a novel, uh, you know, in like a day, and then again and again, you know, she already does this incredible work of, you know, like really uh, showing us the debates that were going on um, in literature, 
within the magazines, especially around gender and sexuality. So that really um, um, was foundational for me to then to go and then, you know, really look closely at some of those debates. So those really were important. So it's not like doing away with theory, but I didn't want to for the art to serve the theory. I wanted to do a visual exegesis, you know, to really start with the objects, because one of the things or not just the object, but with the visual material and this embodiment, because I wanted to figure out what is this, what, what, how, you know, why is like Lipa Brenna so feminist, although she's like super sexy, sells out, super capitalistic, but yet she's like this embodiment of Yugoslavia. And then I saw a couple of years ago, two years ago, I saw an interview with her in which she was so eloquent about why she believes in the Yugoslav project. I, you know, I just had to also account for that kind of feminist, you know, and, and talking about also herself and her upbringing and how in her family, nobody wanted her to be a singer. Nobody wanted her to succeed and have a career. And she was like, yeah, but I did do it and I wanted it. And, you know, and so I really looked at um, actors within the visual culture, also as people who can theorize what it means to be a Yugoslav, what, what Yugoslavia is through the female perspective. So that's to, to your first question, which I think is excellent. Then the second question was class. Oh, yeah. So I think that my book doesn't account for class difference in a really productive way. And I'll just own that. I think that, you know, I hope someone else really looks at the differences. Um, and I think that they will be pretty, you know, intense. Um, and, uh, you know, I just saw Chiara Bonfiglioli's fantastic book presentation yesterday morning, uh, in which she talked about, you know, visualizations of factory women and, you know, their work. And so I don't even talk about them. And they're just as important Yugoslovenkas in, 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 in my mind, you know. And so it was also in some way the challenge was to stop at some point so I can you know, finish. But this is a really important question that I think I'm going to follow um, even maybe into my second book when I think about migration, because that is also so deeply tied to to uh, class, you know, and um, my, my class status and certainly even Zach's class status. We talk about this all the time in terms of, you know, how do you enter these elite spheres when you come from nothing, which is where I come from. And many of us came from. And to this day, you know, you don't have access to certain forms of uh, uh, empowerment that is monetary or that is, you know, commodity based or uh, what do you call it? Like um, when you own something, when you own like property or whatever. <laughs> like so ma and many people in Yugoslavia lost a lot of that during the war, of course. So the class status also changed. But for many, many, it didn't change. And they all even say it. So, you know, uh, a lot of people from Slovenia that I know say, well, the war didn't matter for me, you know, and they in, in a way they didn't experience it the same way that someone like Tanya Stojic did, for example, uh, coming out of Belgrade. So thank you. It's a long answer to really good questions. No, it's great. Thank you, Yasmina. Of course, no one can do everything, and it wasn't in any way a, a criticism. It was just a question, and yeah, yeah, I know, I know exactly what you mean about not being able to include everything. So, but it, it sounds really great anyway. So, and I should also say, I'm having a lot of conversations with people about uh, talking about working class and the. I also come from a working class background, and I think these are important conversations to have. Because, you know, we're not all, you know, academic elites. And I think we need to start talking about that more. So it's great. It's great. Oh, yeah. And you also mentioned the other thing that like, uh, now I remember about um, the artist telling you do not call me Yugoslav. And so this is also really important. Um, so I'm really glad you brought it up. And uh, I also say in my book that I'm using this label and some would might not even agree with it, you know. But for me, uh, it's. It is a political question. Um, so, you know, uh, Yugoslavia as a project um, has a lot of potential. And I'm not talking about the actual state like, you know, right now, but as the idea of multinationalist, uh, you know, multi-ethnic uh, collaborative space um, that's based for me on, uh, you know, the feminist basis of that is, is really uh, important. And the denial of Yugoslav identity often, not always by any means, but often actually is, you know, <laughs> linked to more nationalist investments. And um, I'm trying to remember which theorist or artist wrote this. 
uh, it might come to me later, but you know, they were, oh, um, um, I know, uh, but wrote about like when there's certain times in the, in the art world when it's advantageous to embrace Yugoslav uh, identity and some other times it's absolutely not advantageous. So there's also that geopolitical kind of difference that might influence how many gigs you get, how many exhibitions you get, how you will be, uh, you know, conceptualized within the market. Um, and that certainly, on one hand, of course, we can be very critical. On the other hand, it's understandable <laughs> to, you know, try to find your way, um, uh, you know, to, to make some kind of name for yourself. But thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. And I'll just say that this, the same is true with feminism in Eastern Europe. Right. To use that label is sometimes advantageous and sometimes not. So, yeah. Thank right. you so much, Yasmina. <laughs> you're great. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Oh, here we go. We have a question from Emma. Uh, yes, that's true. Uh, ciao, Yasmina. Hi. Greetings <laughs> from another Yugoslavian <laughs> Uh Well, congratulations, first of all, for your book. I can't wait to read it, and especially the last chapter, because it's related to my master's thesis that I'm currently writing on commodification of Yugo nostalgia in digital environment. And I was really surprised how you mentioned the example of Selma. Uh, Selman relating to the comment how in Yugoslavia everything was perfect and that it was your own experience. So my question is how did you approach the question and the issue of uh, Yugo nostalgia in contemporary art? And do you see Yugo nostalgia in a sense how Petra Belt and uh, Milica Popovic uh, investigated and do a research for subversive potential in Yugo nostalgia? Yeah, that's a really uh, important topic, and I'm super excited about your research. I'd love to hear more uh, about <laughs> what you're doing with the you know digital. Um, I mean, that's certainly a big. Uh, uh, Topic and actually uh, bringing up Chiara again because I just it was so you know I hope all of you know Chiara Bonfiglioli's work who also was um, wrote a very important master's thesis on uh, the first uh, feminist conference. Anyway, so one of the things she mentioned yesterday was that uh, a lot of the people she interviewed, uh, factory workers, and now in the post-Yugoslav context, would say, "Oh, I am not a Yugo nostalgic, but things were better." Blah blah blah. So there's this interesting uh yugo nostalgia is a very interesting way of identifying with uh you know obviously with the dream of a past but also um already by by framing it in a nostalgic way it degrades it right it already faults it as something wrong and um and of course it's often in reaction to the extremely horrifyingly bad <laughs> conditions under neoliberal capitalism um so I think that uh, as Svetlana Boyem also writes about nostalgia, it can be extremely um, productive and it can also, of course, be mobilized for nationalism. Um, so I, I talk a little bit about this and I wrote about it also um, after I saw um, the fantastic MoMA exhibition uh, concrete utopias uh, about Yugoslavia, which in itself is a Yugo nostalgic exhibition um full force and unabashedly so and i think it's really uh, a very productive way of thinking about you know um architecture in yugoslavia as a collective endeavor of course there've been critiques of of you know what is being left out out of that narrative but i think that there's always things left out of certain narratives but sometimes the kernel of of a particular memory or um a feeling of resistance can be very productive, even if it is nostalgic and based in fallacy. So um, I think that Sama Salman, when she told me the story of the children calling her Tito, I mean, I, I was I couldn't even I could barely process because, you know, they haven't Tito is long dead since 1980. And so here are the children who were born maybe 1995, 1996 or even later in 2000 who still remember through 
passing on through their families this important figure and leader who actually, even if still Yugoslavia had issues of racism, and that's also something that came through in the uh, Concrete Utopia show when they're at the uh, um, you know Holocaust Memorial, um, but the the rhetoric alone of you know brotherhood and unity, even though it's staunchly patriarchal transforms the the question of belonging in 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 really like in really profound ways and of course also systemically thinking about you know inclusions in the school better workplace conditions and so of course the next generation of children will still be given this narrative from people who have lived through better times and so i think nostalgia a new nostalgia is also a way of preserving the memory of some of the really important uh, uh, um, you know developments towards you know racial equality and by no means achieved racial equality but at least a movement towards it instead of a movement against it which you know we just saw in the united states <laughs> how much you know that how much is at stake in, in, in when it comes to those kinds of rhetorics um so i think that yugo nostalgia can is is can also of course be used in the art world has been used in the art world to sell more work um but it also sometimes moves against um some of the more uh, negative um um ideas around Yugoslavia so like Marina Abramović is an extreme like critique you know a, a, someone who critiques the what does she call it the total ugliness the the aesthetic of total ugliness and darkness and bleakness you know come you know coming of age in Yugoslavia and that's quite hard to comprehend at times but also you know she makes a very good visual case for it when she describes you know how how she grew up but the experience of the people i talked to a lot of the time was very different and i don't think it necessarily means it's yugo nostalgic it's just a different narrative and the longing for it says a lot more about our current times maybe than it does about you know Yugoslavia itself but for me it's very important and 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 productive also because the cold war rhetoric of socialism being this like terrible thing and so dark and all these that you know is is really still very prevalent and ideologically especially where I'm writing in the United States and the other thing that i'm really interested in and my book only begins this is this idea of sexuality and marxism and and, and socialism and in the the kind of you know the ways in which uh why why is every history of socialism so like dark or so technical about you know economy and like analysis you know i'm much more interested in some of the things that happened around uh, gender and sexuality and and some of the yugo nostalgic projects are also more invested in those kinds of things because they they often uh, come out in 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 pop culture so i hope that answered your question thank you so much i i can't wait for your project yes yes <laughs> thank you very much again Yeah and we can be in touch if you want you know if if you want to Definitely I will follow up. Thank you. All right, thank. Any other questions? People are probably exhausted. <laughs> well, I I actually have one and okay. I was thinking I didn't know if I was going to ask it but you actually brought it up. Oh, okay. And it's um completely open ended however you want to approach it but I think it's interesting to talk about the fact that you work in the United States, you know, as a way to actually kind of situate yourself and think about um, you know, how the project has particularly come to be there because I I think that's interesting for, you know, people to learn about and mm -hmm. um hear your experience and perspective on about what you choose to work based on where you choose to live and how that can you know it's often a mixture of certain productivity certain major hindrances but um i i think yeah i, I mean yeah. i know some of this but i i think it would be great for you to hear yeah so um first of all i want to just say i was extremely lucky to go to duke university where um you know my mentor christine styles was very open and extremely encouraging for me to study my region and to work on my region and who connected me with a lot of archives and a lot of people so that was the first time in my academic career 
that I had come across an American scholar who was extremely excited about working on the region. And that from, that's what changed my life completely before, because until then, sort of the Balkans and Yugoslavia was complete. No one taught it. I had no, you know, maybe Marina Abramovic, but it wasn't really about her background. It was about endurance. It was about other more like universal concepts in, in performance. So it really took until I went to Duke University to do my graduate work for me to have a chance to even visit, revisit my region and to kind of think about it. And that was a huge gift. And, you know, I did my work there. And um, in terms of, you know, <laughs> navigating the job market and, and, you know, your sort of scholarly life in the United States, um, you know, one of the things we end up having to do and me and my other North American situated friends laugh about this, you know, every time I, I would give this talk, let's say, um, you know, for the University for Humanities Festival or something, I have to include the map. I have to include years. I have to explain who killed whom, who was warring with whom, what, what was, you know, what, that Yugoslavia was not part of the Eastern Bloc. I have to show it on the map. You know, there's a lot of setup that I have to do because there's been moments, and this happened to my colleague Katya Praznik, who happens to also be at University of Buffalo, where people, like she will, you know, people will think, oh, but that's the Baltics. Is that the Baltics? And then you have to be like, no, it's the Balkans. <laughs> and then you have to explain what the Balkans are. So in some ways, sometimes that part is a little bit more challenging. Um, but what's been really generative for me, um, you know, and I am part of this diaspora who lived in Germany for all these years. I speak German. I went to German high school. Then I came to the United States and I, you know, studied art history in the Western sense. And then I started only in my Ph.D. to really look at, at my region is like it's very generative to have audience members who are working on similar issues, let's say, in Latin America and Central America, you know, so. One of my colleagues, even in graduate school, Kenzie Cornejo, which many of you, who many of you know, has been extremely important influence also on my thinking of, of like, you know, theoretical interventions and questions about race and, and injustice in my own region, or even Fredo Rivera, who we saw earlier today, who works on Cuba. You know, so those are the wonderful moments of intersection that I love having in the United States. And then, of course, uh, um, you know, all these questions around racial justice and resistance that I think are really, really prolific and really productive also in the U United States Academy and the North American Academy. But otherwise, sometimes it can be quite lonely as a Yugoslav scholar. But I am lucky because there's another uh, person who's interested in the topic at UB, Katya Praznik, who I mentioned. And then, of course, Boena Vidikanic, who just published a book on um, non-aligned modernism, who is at the University at Waterloo, just across the border here, who is also a refugee from Bosnia. And so we start, we're starting to kind of find each other within the United States. But the topic itself is often quite... Uh, marginal within discourses. Um, and I really hope that that will change eventually, because I think that the Balkans and Yugoslavia and immigrants from that region and, and sort of the ways in which, you know, Yugoslovanka as, as the this like icon really shows us also that race is very complicated in the European context. So, you know, to hear a Yugoslovenka like uh, me or like uh, Boyana is read as a white woman, but in the European context, you are read as this South, e you know, Eastern, uh, 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 you know, other. And one of the stories I always tell is that, you know, my mother, who was a seamstress or was a seamstress um, in Germany, was frequently asked if her daughters, when she was working in Germany, are seamstresses too or if we're cleaning ladies. So there is this assumption that this is the kind of work of the South, you know, the Yugoslav women, the immigrants, you know, that, that can't really rise in the academies and, and that are there to serve, you know, uh, white German society. And some of that has is still very operative. And so the question around citizenship and ethnic identity and race and uh, feminism is extremely important and is quite different than in the United States. But the United States is a really good place to start thinking about these nuances as well. So uh, it's sometimes it's very lonely. And also the other thing, uh, it's really expensive, you know, to fly to Europe and do all this research. 
um, and I'm at a state school. I have no research budget. So in the last, you know, 10 years, every trip to Europe to see my family included all this research I would do in order to, you know, get as much done as possible. I did have a very lucky break when I was, I had a two month fellowship in Munich that was paid and then I could do a lot of research there. But in general, it's it's a little bit, it depends on the institutional funding you have that allows you to travel. And now with COVID, you know, things are way worse. So, but um, that would be my long answer. I don't know if that covers it, but yeah. Oh, wait, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Um, someone in the chat uh, wrote, any chance we could read your PhD work? This lecture was electrifying. Thank you. <laughs> so I think <laughs> usually, whether you like it or not, unless Jasmina has an embargo on it, in, a, in the U.S., you have to upload your dissertations to these libraries, and it's made available after a certain amount of time. But but I want to say, I mean, Amy pointed this out. My dissertation is completely different than my book. So, you know, I hope you find it interesting. But I have an article coming out, actually, that's based on my book um, that will be available really soon um, uh, with the feminist journal Vagadu and Diana Yelacha, who's also written fantastic work on film, uh, screen memories, and on Yugoslavia, check out her, her uh, amazing scholarship. She's published and, and, and um, editing a special issue on socialism and feminism for Vagadu, the, the feminist journal. So I, I'll have a piece coming out in that. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the PhD for me is the kind of thing I did so long ago. And that's when I began to kind of think about this. But my book is really completely different. So but it's going to come out soon in 2021. <laughs> it all goes well. um, thank you. We also only... Lament. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we, can I say yeah. something? Yeah. Oh, yes, please. Go for I'm it. sorry. My camera is not working. I don't know why. So yes, Miriana. Uh, and uh, I am really, you blow me away. Not you, Dwalasime. Oh, <laughs> oh, it's <perfect>. really amazing. <laughs> yes, you know, I got uh, this information by chance. A friend of mine, Sergeant Knezhevich, sent me yesterday, and I was like, yeah. <laughs> and also, uh, I was yesterday at the uh, Chiara Bonfiglioli uh, lecture as well. <laughs> <laughs> and I studied with Marina Grzinic. Wow, uh, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, but um, so I have a question, but I just want to share something else because it was this question about like if the Yugoslavia or Yugoslavian can still live and so on. So I live in Vienna and yeah. there's a lot of us here yeah. and from ex-Yugoslavia. And in a way, there is this thing, you know, us versus uh, them, everybody else. Yes. <laughs> and we call also ourselves uh, Nashi. Uh, I don't know how to translate this in English exactly. Ours. Mm -hmm. Nashi and uh, the language, of course, we also call Nash. So we, uh, in uh, arts and uh, culture or work, we started to kind of when we do our publications or posters, when we write the languages that are like there in these lectures, we would write Nash <laughs> instead of Mikhaes. Uh, so this was this, but I want to ask where uh, we can buy uh, the book. How do we get the book? <laughs> The book is not out yet. I, you know, it's going to hopefully come out December 2021. So it's all submitted. I mean, it's, it's, you know, approved. I have a contract, but it's going to take almost, yeah, a year for it to come out. So, but it will also, there will also be an electronic version of it. So hopefully your library, if it, buy, you know, if it can buy the book a lot of, then you can just download it or download certain chapters. So. Thank you. Much. Oh, thank you. And I love that you mentioned this idea of Nash, Nash or whatever, because I remember when I went to the um, uh, MoMA exhibition, um, uh, uh, you know, Concrete Utopias. I mean, I was all I was hearing is Nash Yezik. It was just, <laughs> you know, beautiful. And I got like teary eyed and I was like, oh, my God, this new nostalgia is just so deeply in me. And, I, and it's very real. Um, and it kind of. I said this in another context, but I have to say, you know, um, this curatorial project um, by Vladimir Kulich was so, inc so important for me to gain the confidence also to sort of embrace that wish to do this work and to say, yes, OK, I'm going to also tell this other story of socialism on Yugoslav socialism that I feel like I belong to. 
um, because I felt like I belong when I watch, you know, when I was at the show. And that's a very rare feeling to have when you are part of a diaspora that no longer has a country, but you have all these feelings of connection to people, nevertheless. Um, so, yeah, thank you. That's such an important, you know. Uh, and yeah. Vienna is, by the way, I love Vienna so much because of exactly what you you describe. You know, yeah. <laughs> you can drink raki and eat Ivar everywhere. Yes, yeah, yeah. you get it by bus. <laughs> <laughs> but I think also this work that you do is also very important because uh, somehow I was not aware that the people are receiving the Yugoslav women living in uh, Yugoslavia at that time uh, as victims. And this is yesterday actually. Chiara mentioned this. I was like, really. When, because you know, when I, when I came here, I realized that the women and men are not paid the same for the same work. And I was like, what? And then that the, in the seventies still, you know, they had to go with the husband to, to the bank to open the bank account and stuff like that, you know, and then I'm, I'm thinking, come on, you know, <laughs> sure, the, the, you know, double burden and patriarchy, but you know, here they took a bus to Sweden to make an abortion. I mean, you know. Yeah, this yeah. is really, and I think this book, uh, the you know your book, it's really putting the things into perspective, and it's very good because we can cite it and we can show it also in this kind of circle. So thank you also. Thank for you this. so much. I'm so honored. Oh my god. I'm gonna jump in. Um, we have a question from Susan Shoopley, and maybe since we only have a few minutes left, maybe we can <clears throat> end with Susan's question. But also, just before Susan jumps in, there was. A question in the chat about when is your article about your book going to come out? Um, it was I just got the proofs last week. I sent them off. So it depends on the journal. But very soon, I hope very soon. So keep an eye on it. I, I, I hope within the next month. So the proofs were approved. <laughs> hi, hi, Susan. Hi, Susan. Nice Go. You. It's been a couple of years. We met a couple of years ago. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> but oh, you're muted. <laughs> oh my goodness, my dog is just starting to bark. Where did we see <laughs> Sorry. Uh, maybe. You're muted again. <laughs> it's just that my dog has started to bark. I'm sorry. But um, yeah, no, thank you firstly for a really brilliantly articulated and really politically um, compelling presentation. I really appreciate this, the just the kind of explicit sense of commitment that is operating in your project. It's really um, admirable. And I guess I was just curious, uh, maybe a little bit, it's a small question in relationship to what Zach was saying. And I just wonder how your um, work on socialism, how do you actually Negotiate that in the day to day in a context where there's such a kind of, uh, just kind of very extremely anti 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 antagonistic relationship to these kinds of politics in the United States. And as someone who spent most of my life in Canada, even to have Canada positioned as a socialist country is like beyond, uh, <laughs> comprehension i just want how do you actually negotiate your intellectual life when there's such a kind of misconstrued understanding of any notion of a socialist kind of project that's operating in the day to day oh <laughs> you just know how to hit at the heart of some of the problems <laughs> at the end here um honestly i mean like with anything i mean the only way to survive it is to be very direct about how you don't you know this is a different reading of socialism and for me you know the american uh, north american idea of what socialism is is very different than what yugoslav socialism was and one of my you know duties is to kind of explain why that is but of course i do it in a very narrow way so a lot of the time you know that happens in the q and a where people are like oh well um, you know, be, because of collectivism, it was all about individualism and, you know, because of oppression, this is they were doing it because of oppression. Then I have to be like, actually, no, women were a lot less oppressed. And I go through all of this. So uh, 
Yeah, as I said with Zach, uh, with Zach's question, I have to do a lot of other educating around it in terms of just like giving the background because of the Cold War rhetoric. Um, but I think it's also kind of productive in, in some ways because um, it gives you such a good opportunity to show what has already existed, you know, and what some of us have experienced or some of our family members have experienced, a very different model of socialism. Um, and so sometimes it's a moment of opportunity, but a lot of the time there's also a kind of um, the other side of things is also that there's a huge uh, nostalgia for communism and socialism that is also kind of completely not thinking about, you know, some of the more oppressive elements that also I can't stand, you know, <laughs> that also kind of gets me like, OK, let's not just forget about all the people that were killed and, you know, Stalinism, ahoy, you know, I, that is for me also very um, uh, easy, slippery slope of kind of fascination. And that's why I think thinking about patriarchy and nationalism and racism as still being kind of underlying forces, even within the socialist system that that uh, I grew up in, is really important because it's a reminder that just the socialism and this like idea, you know, even in the leftist positive sense is not really the solution. <laughs> you know, you have to kind of think about all these intersecting problems before you can kind of build a socialist society. But of course, the other whole element is that was my first thought, uh, Susan, when you said this is like, you know, when Trump was still running for president, every time the radio, he I would hear him, he would be like, we'll vote against socialism. And I had to like turn off the radio because I can't even fathom the American concept of Biden being a socialist. It's like so absurd. So, yeah, you know, it's really hard to do like nuanced, deep intellectual work when even the president of the country uses the term in such a like, you know, warped way. So, yeah, <laughs> we're past. It's already one minute past two. So I don't want to keep you. But <laughs> I think that was a great note to end on. Um <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, let's everyone. You let's thank Jasmine. It was such an amazing <laughs> evening. It was great to hear the project. Yeah, thank um, you. Thank, thank you so <laughs> much. It was such a pleasure. I wish we could all go and have some rakia and some some Balkan food. Yeah, you know? that would be great. <laughs> rakia. <laughs> and you know, if if um, if I have a book launch or something in in um. In Vojvodina, where my mother lives, everyone will be invited and she will cook for everybody, you know. <laughs> so we'll have a great celebration together. Thank you all so much. The questions were Thank so many. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmina. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Beautiful session. Thank you. Thank you, Zach, as well. Fantastic. Yes. Both of you. Thank you. Really done. Bye-bye.